It's Game Boy World, and this is Serpent. I feel like every few episodes of Game Boy World sees publishers reaching ever further back into the past in search of source material. The platform has seen quite a few conversions of classics that were five, even ten years old by the time they arrived on Game Boy. With Serpent, I'm pretty sure we've hit the absolute limit on just how far back the Game Boy library will reach. Until Atari dredges up Pong for Game Boy Color about a decade after the debut of Serpent, I'm fairly certain this is as far back into the past as we'll ever be seeing. We've seen Tetris from 1985, Karataka from 1984, Loadrunner from 1983, Sokoban from 1982, Hey Yankyo Alien from 1979, and most recently Space Invaders from 1978. But Serpent spanks them all, with its origins in the dim and distant year of 1976. Serpent, as the name suggests, is essentially a variant on the classic game Snake, a premise so basic and easily produced that it's become a sort of universal time waster. If you ever owned an Nokia phone in the dark days before touchscreens and advanced apps, you almost certainly had a copy of Snake in that folder of primitive Java programs you never touched. Snake probably had its greatest moment in the sun as a memorable sequence in Disney's Tron. The light cycle competition was basically a head-to-head -head VR rendition of Snake. Whether a serpent, a snake, or a light cycle, the fundamental mechanics are always more or less the same. As your snake cruises around the screen, it leaves behind its ever-growing tail, which must be avoided for as long as possible. Snake can be either a single-player venture, where your task is simply to avoid smacking into yourself, or a competitive challenge in which you try and trap another player. Serpent takes this latter tack, whether you play solo or against another person. If you're not fighting another player, you have to deal with the CPU. Anyway, back to the history angle. Serpent, or Snake, or Light Cycles, whichever form you prefer, can trace its history back to 1976 or 77, when a Gremlin-developed arcade title called Blockade made its debut courtesy of Sega. You've heard of Sega, of course, and Gremlin was a pretty big player in the early arcade games too. The American manufacturer designed its own games, including 1978's influential proto-platformer Frogs, in addition to localizing a number of Japanese creations, like Namco's GB, before merging with Sega. Blockade was the company's breakout title, a simple but addictive competitive challenge to simply avoid a collision with your tail, the opponent's tail, or the arena walls for as long as possible. It was widely imitated almost immediately across the industry. And here, almost a decade and a half on from Blockade's debut, we have developer Duel and publisher Naxat, Taxan in the US, attempting to evolve the concept for a contemporary audience. It's a weird and not entirely successful effort, but you have to admire that they even tried at all. Then again, it's not entirely without precedent. You may remember the name Duel as the developer of Boomer's Adventure in Asmic World. While that was a different kind of game produced for a completely different publisher, the guiding principle behind Asmic World wasn't entirely dissimilar from what we see here in Serpent. Namely, both games took a venerable 1970s vintage video game premise and attempted to tart them up for the 90s. Asmic World added an item system and boss battles to the Hei Yankyo Alien concept, which was pretty wacky but overall not a bad approach. Similarly, Serpent adds its own power-up system to Snake. It's a much simpler revamp than its original subject matter, lacking the overarching quest that Duel implemented in Asmic World, but that fits the premise. Serpent changes up the workings of Snake first and foremost by removing the penalty for colliding with walls and tails. Hitting an obstruction is no longer an instant loss, instead, you simply come to a stop, kind of like in Pac-Man. You only lose a battle if you remain motionless for 5 seconds. So the goal here is to trap the other player, not simply to cause a collision. To assist in your task, you can collect power-ups that appear seemingly without warning or reason around the field. In my experience, they tend to appear close to the CPU opponent in single-player games, but maybe I just have bad luck. In any case, the power-ups revolve around the two fundamental principles that define your serpent length and speed. Certain icons allow you to shorten the length of your serpent, while others affect the opponent's speed. The design of the game's power-ups and power-downs is pretty strange if you get right down to it. The icons that allow you to shorten your serpent mainly serve to make it more difficult to trap the opponent. And of the two speed attacks, which allow you to change your opponent's rate of movement if you can manage to score a hit on the serpent's head with a missile, only the slowing attack seems useful. Being slowed is basically an instant loss, since it becomes a simple matter for your opponent to surround you and box you in. Meanwhile, boosting your opponent's speed is just completely brain dead, since it practically guarantees your loss. The only situation in which boosting the other serpent's movement works to your advantage is if they've become boxed in. Speeding up forces them to move around and burn through their available space more quickly, making it less likely that they'll be able to wait it out and sneak through an opening. 
By far the worst design decision in the game has to do with the controls. Duel decided to make the controls relative to the serpent rather than absolute based on the player perspective, so pressing left causes the serpent to turn to its left rather than to the player's. Strangely though, the controls were mapped to the left direction on the D-pad and the A button. I have no idea what the logic behind this setup was, but it makes mastery of the controls bizarrely difficult. In Japan, Naxit published Serpent, or rather Kakomunja, which translates roughly into the encircling snake. Meanwhile, Serpent came to us courtesy of Taxan in the US. Of course, Naxat and Taxan were essentially the same company, as hinted at by the fact that their names are mirror images of each other. The publisher had a tendency to favor sci-fi themes in their game, e.g. Alien Crush or Low G-Man, which could explain the oddball story grafted onto Serpent. As seen in the title screen, both the player's snake and the enemy's eel are mech suits duking it out for galactic supremacy. After each round, your snake pilot offers a report on the outcome of the latest skirmish on the war effort. Weird, yes, but memorable. One other first happens here, the pre-game demo mode shows off the very first visual effect keyed specifically to the Game Boy screen. The demo background strobes rapidly between the two lightest shades of the Game Boy screen. On the actual hardware, the slow screen refresh rate causes this strobe effect to create the impression of a fifth shade of gray not naturally available on the Game Boy. But on a device like the Super Game Boy, without the refresh delay, it simply leads to an irritating flash effect. Thankfully, the strobe effect doesn't appear during actual gameplay, or else Servant would be practically unusable on anything but original Game Boy hardware. In summary, this is one of Game Boy's more unique games, despite being based on a concept that might actually be installed on more electronic devices than Minesweeper. Servant puts some loopy spins on an arcade standard, and the result is moderately amusing, if not always player-friendly. For more ancient arcade games, keep watching Game Boy World. In fact, next episode concerns another Game Boy Blast from the past, albeit not quite from as far back as Servant. Game Boy World is made possible by cool people who fund it at patreon.com slash gamesbyte and through sales of Game Boy World 1989 at amazon.com. Thanks.